Thank you all for being here. Um, I, the title of my talk is Researching Pain, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. I'm going to talk more about how we go about researching pain and a little bit less on what many of our findings have been, although we can certainly get into that during question uh, and answer. So just a little bit about me. I, I graduated with a degree in psychology. Uh, then I pursued my Ph.D. in clinical psychology. I actually practiced clinically uh, in private hospitals for about three years and then returned uh, to academics uh, for a postdoc and then a faculty position, and sort of the rest is history, I guess. Uh, so we're going to talk about pain today. I suspect everybody here has experienced pain of one sort or another. It's an important thing for us to have the ability to experience and so even though pain is universal and we all know what it is, it's somewhat difficult to define, right? This is probably the most widely used definition of pain, which suggests that pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. And so a couple of things I point out about this definition. The hallmark of pain is that it is unpleasant. If you are experiencing something that is not unpleasant, that is not pain, okay? And of course, not all unpleasant things are pain, but every pain is unpleasant. That's part of its very nature. But maybe a more critical and surprising component of this definition is that pain is not simply a sensory experience it is always both sensory and emotional. That emotional aspect of pain is what gives it its unpleasantness. And there are actually distinct brain regions that sort of encode the emotional nature of pain as separate from the sensory nature of pain. And then maybe the last thing I'd point out here is we typically associate pain with something going wrong in our body. We break an arm, we cut ourselves, that's tissue damage. But in many instances, we encounter patients who are experiencing significant pain in the absence of any discernible tissue damage. You do not have to have injury or tissue damage to have pain. Uh, pain is actually a product of the brain. Uh, and, and so as long as it sounds like tissue damage, it's pain. Now, one other qualification that the taxonomy committee th that came up with this definition went on to tell us about is that activity induced here, it says, in nociceptive pathways. Those are the nerves that transmit information about pain. So activity in those nerves, that's not pain. Pain is always a psychological state which is how somebody who's a psychologist ends up somehow belonging in the field of pain research. Pain is a personal, subjective, psychological experience. It's not simply a biological phenomenon. And my title says the good, the bad, and the ugly. I realize that many of the students here uh, have no idea what this movie is. This is a spaghetti western that was released, I believe, in about 1966. I was uh, actually too young to watch it then, but I've seen it since. Uh, and so this is Clint Eastwood. It's a classic Western. Uh, bring it up on Netflix or something, and you might enjoy that. Um, and so what, what is the good about pain? Pain is critical for survival. Right? It's our warning sign to let us know that something is wrong, that we need to protect an injured area to permit healing, or we need to go check something out to find out what's causing the pain. In fact, there are people who were born without the ability to feel pain. They have genetic disorders that render them unable to experience pain, and they typically have a much shorter lifespan than the rest of us because they don't have this warning signal. So there is this good aspect to pain. Well, what's the bad? Uh, and this is the, uh, I think this is Lee Van Cleef who played the bad guy in the movie. Uh, the bad about pain is that the experience of pain can persist and hijack our body so that it then becomes chronic and has a life of its own. 
and chronic pain can become a disease in its own dimensions, completely separate from whatever injury might have initiated the pain. This is the type of pain that we had the most trouble diagnosing and treating uh, in our biomedical system today. So there is this dark side to pain uh, that we have trouble dealing with. Well, if that's the bad, then what's the ugly? Um, there are a couple of ugly things about pain. One is it's hard to research, right? In most fields of biomedicine, we study animal models. Let's say you're studying cancer, animal models of tumor and different kinds of cancer, and you can measure tumor growth and so on and so forth. I've already told you that pain is an internal psychological experience. We can't very well ask rodents how much pain they're feeling. Well, we could ask them, but they're not going to answer very impressively. Uh, and so animal models of pain and, and other aspects of studying pain are quite challenging. The other part of the ugly is that funding for pain research lags well behind most other diseases, and I'll show you why I think pain needs more funding. Uh, and, and so our progress for pain research uh, has been quite slow, right? The gold standard for treating pain has been treating pain for thousands of years. That's from the opium poppy, right? So let's talk about pain as a public health problem. The Institute of Medicine commissioned uh, a report now four years ago. Uh, one of their conclusions that didn't surprise many of us is that pain is a major public health issue. Chronic pain, that is pain lasting for, pain on more days than not lasting typically for six months or more, affects 100 million people in this country. And it costs over $600 billion a year. So the personal and societal costs of pain are enormous. If we sh should put that in context here, these are data on the point prevalence. That is, if we surveyed everybody in America right now and found out how many of them have cancer, how many of them have HIV AIDS, and so on and so forth, here are the numbers we would come up with, and you would see that chronic pain dwarfs all of these other very challenging, difficult chronic conditions. So chronic pain is a major public health issue, and if we look at the cost to society, chronic pain costs dramatically more than these other conditions. In fact, chronic pain costs more than cancer, AIDS, and heart disease combined. So we are dealing with a major public health issue here, uh, and so pain research is critical in achieving a better understanding of pain and better diagnosis and treatment of pain. So the question that always comes up is, how do you measure pain? People want to know if we can reach inside the body and measure the pain substrate and tell people how much pain they're in. And the obvious answer to that is no. I've already told you that pain is a psychological state. I'm still reliant on what people tell me to know how much pain they're in. So self-report remains the gold standard for measuring pain. There are other things we can measure that may help us understand more about the pain. There are behavioral measures. You know, if you see somebody reaching for their back or grimacing, that may be a sign that they're in pain. Although, frankly, I just did that and I'm in no pain whatsoever. But there are behavioral signs of pain that we can measure. And then there are physiological responses that often occur in the presence of pain. If I'm in a lot of pain, my blood pressure might go up. Uh, I might sweat more. My respiration rate might go up. So those things can change, although pain is not the only thing that would cause those responses. So those changes aren't specific to pain, but they can help us sort of document the impact of someone's pain on their body. And then there's a great deal of excitement about using various technologies to measure what the brain is doing in order to quantify pain. Um, and if we are going to develop a biomarker for pain, it's most likely going to be a brain biomarker. So there's a lot of research going on at UF, including in our lab, looking at how people's brains are changing when they're either experiencing chronic pain or when they're experiencing acute pain. But back to self-report. There are a lot of different ways to ask people about how much pain they're experiencing. 
one might be to ask somebody, well, uh, are you having pain, yes or no? If so, how would you describe that pain? Mild, moderate, severe? That's easy to understand, but not very sensitive, right? It's not the best way from a research perspective to measure pain. Better measures of pain are to use, for example, numerical scales. I'd like you to rate your pain on a scale from 0 to 100, where 0 means no pain and 100 means the most intense pain you can imagine. That's the typical numerical pain rating scale. Once people get used to that, they're able to rate pain fairly consistently. I'll give you an example of a visual analog scale, which is very similar, but it actually uses a line rather than a number. And then there are multiple item scales. It may not be en enough for me to know how much pain you're experiencing. I might also need to know what is that pain like, right? A sharp shooting pain that's rated 50 out of 100 might be very different from a dull aching pain that's rated 50 out of 100. Uh, and so getting some information on the quality of the pain can be helpful. So I mentioned a visual analog scale. And in a study we're doing, we could present somebody with a piece of paper that looks just like this, and I would ask them to indicate by bisecting this line to tell me where their pain is, going from no pain to the worst pain imaginable. And if they were to place their mark right there, I would get out my handy ruler and measure the distance from the no pain end of that line to where their mark was that would be a 57 millimeter on a 0 to 100 millimeter visual analog scale. Okay. This is statistically the best way to measure pain, although it can be cumbersome and you often have to train people what you mean. And there's some evidence that older adults in particular don't do as well with visual analog scales. Okay. So numerical scales are typically a satisfactory substitute. So what do we do in my lab? We're very interested in individual differences in pain. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what I mean by that. But we want to understand what causes individual differences and how these individual difference factors might contribute to clinical pain, real pain that people experience. So what are individual differences? Well, these are differences between people in lots of characteristics, could be abilities, attitudes, in this instance we're talking about pain experiences. And there's been a lot of interest in individual differences for many, many years, but as the genomic revolution occurred, it became much more legitimate to study individual differences because now there's a biological basis for that, right? But genetics are clearly not the only thing that contribute. And it's long been recognized that individual differences are important in a medical setting. Uh, Sir William Osler, who is one of the fathers of American medicine, said it is much more important to know what sort of a patient has a disease than what sort of disease a patient has. Emphasizing that what the individual brings with them to, to the disease will greatly impact how that disease is expressed and experienced. So here's an example of individual differences. So this is pain after a fairly standardized surgical procedure. This is a, a laparoscopic removal of the gallbladder, common surgery. And let's say you were going in for the surgery tomorrow and you ask your physician, well, how much pain am I going to experience after this surgery? Well, your physician might rely on this median pain score, sort of the average pain score for this whole group. So six hours after surgery, on average, people's pain was pretty close to 50 out of 100. Okay. But every dot that you see there is a person in the study. And so what if you're one of these people down in the bottom? Well, you're lucky. You didn't have any pain. That's great. If you're one of these people up top, not so good, right? And so, to be honest, your physician would say, I have no idea how much pain you're going to experience. It's going to be somewhere between zero and 100, okay? And these are individual differences in pain. And maybe you're thinking, well, every surgery is a little bit different. 
also, after surgery and before surgery, people got medicines, and so maybe they got different medicines, and maybe they responded differently to the medicines. And so in comes the kind of work that we do, where we bring people into the lab, and we provide the pain, okay? We apply standardized stimuli. This is a very small nylon probe that really produces very mild pain. We poke people with that. We use blunt pressure and measure the amount of pressure required to produce pain. We use ice cold water to determine how long people can tolerate that kind of pain. We use a computerized heat stimulus to measure different aspects of pain. Uh, we're working on a little something oh, new sorry, here. Like no, there? no, this is, <laughs> we're not actually doing this. This is a, an actual person though, right? People do this for sport. Um, which is an interesting nuance about pain. There aren't many people who seek out cancer or diabetes for fun, right? There's, but there's culturally some nobility in experiencing pain, uh, and we have to take that into account. I apologize for the graphic nature of some of these slides. Um, so how do we assess responses in our laboratory? Well, one thing we measure is pain threshold, which is the minimum amount of stimulation required to first produce a painful sensation. We also often measure pain tolerance. That's the maximum stimulus intensity that an individual is able or willing to tolerate. Okay. And then we can also do what we call super threshold scaling, which is basically ap applying a stimulus at a certain level and asking people to somehow tell us how painful that was. Typically that's with a numerical rating scale. So these are different ways of measuring pain. They tap into slightly different aspects of the pain experience. And I'll give you an example here. Here we applied a 48 degree heat stimulus to the arm. We asked people to rate how painful is that stimulus on a scale from 0 to 100. On average, our participants rated this at almost a 72, so it's really fairly painful. But some people barely found it painful at all, rating it 5 out of 100. And others found it exquisitely painful. Uh, and we stopped as soon as they said 100. So the individual differences... Yeah, 48 centigrade, about 118 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and so what we're seeing is the same individual differences, the same wild disparity in pain experiences that we saw after surgery. And this has nothing to do with medications or health problems or the stimulus was identical for everybody. So this is just what pain is. It's wildly different across people. We're interested in many different factors that drive individual differences. I'll show you some examples uh, of a couple of these today, uh, but we're pursuing research on all of these factors, gender differences, racial and ethnic group differences, age differences, psychological factors, and genetic factors. And here's some examples of gender differences. So this is actually a study we're doing of middle-aged and older adults who have knee arthritis, so they already have pain. Uh, and we are here assessing pressure pain threshold. And the question here is, how much pressure do we have to apply for you to first feel pain? Okay. And so higher values mean lower sensitivity to pain. And you can see that all the blue bars, which are male, are higher than all the pink bars, which are female. Uh, and these results are all significant. You see different places where we're assessing people. The medial and lateral joint are on the knee, the quadriceps, of course, the thigh muscle, the trapezius, and the epicondyle. So whether we're testing our arthritis patients where they have pain or somewhere else on the body, we see the same pattern of gender differences. Okay. We look at heat pain threshold and heat pain tolerance, and so this is at what temperature do you first feel pain? That's heat pain threshold. And at what temperature do you say, that's it, I'm ready, I'm ready to stop? And again, we see that the temperatures are significantly lower for females than for males for both threshold and tolerance, and that's true at the knee and at the arm. Now, part of that might be what we see here. We ask people, 
when they push the button for threshold and when they push the button for tolerance to tell us how painful that was. And women are telling us that tolerance was less painful than men are telling us. So this might suggest that women are smarter than men, right? Because they're pushing the button at a lower level of pain and that might help explain why this temperature is lower. But we do see these gender differences. Uh, these are incredibly consistent across lots of laboratories, lots of populations. This is simply the pattern that you find when you test people in the laboratory. Now those are static measures of pain. One stimulus, one response. Here we're taking our little nylon filament and we poke you once and we say how painful was that? And then we poke you 10 times in a row rapidly and we say how painful was that? And the difference between the painfulness of 10 pokes and one poke is what we refer to as temporal summation. That is, even though the filament produces the same force on every poke, because we're stimulating you over and over again, the neurons, particularly in your spinal cord, are responding with more vigor to that, to that stimulus. And that's known as temporal summation of pain, right? And you can experience this yourself if you get into your car on a hot summer day and you put your hand on the steering wheel and it's hot and you just leave it there and see how much hotter and more painful it feels. It's not that the steering wheel is getting hotter, it's that your body is processing that information differently and in order to warn you, okay, it's time to get your hands off the wheel, right? So this temporal summation is a healthy response. And at least at the knee, what we see is that not only did women provide higher pain ratings, but they showed a greater increase going from one to 10 pokes, suggesting greater temporal summation of pain. And this also has been shown many different times. Those are simply tests of how the pain system works uh, at baseline. How pain sensitive are you and how much are you turning up the amplification on your pain system when we keep poking you? We can do other tests to tap into how well your pain control systems work, right? So we, we have systems in our body that modulate how we experience pain that's coming in. And some of those systems turn up the gain on pain and make us more sensitive to pain. Some of those systems turn down the gain on pain, making us less sensitive to pain. This is our test for how well you turn down the gain on pain. And it works like this. I apply a heat stimulus to your hand and I say, how painful was that? And you say, that was a 75 out of 100. I then ask you to stick your opposite foot in ice cold water to induce pain in your foot. While your foot is in the ice cold water, I apply the exact same heat pain stimulus to your hand and lo and behold, it hurts way less. Okay. And this is not simply distraction. Okay. I can also do this right after you take your foot out of the water when the foot pain is no longer there and you still feel less pain in your hand. And then after a while, so this difference here is your pain inhibitory response. That's how well your pain control system is working. You've reduced your pain by 40 units. Uh, and then after recovery, the hand pain would be just as intense. And we've done this test in lots of uh, patient groups and in healthy individuals. And one thing that we've observed, for example, is that this system starts failing as we get older. Our ability to dampen pain seems not to work as well as we age. And so these are three groups of healthy adults, younger adults in their 20s, middle-aged adults in their 40s, and older adults, mid-60s and on, and we see a nice pain reduction in the younger adults, a small pain reduction in the middle-aged adults, and just no pain reduction whatsoever in the older adults. Okay. And so this is just a sampling of some of the ways that we study pain and some of the findings that we can come up with. As a summary, I hope you're convinced that pain is characterized by robust individual differences. People experience pain 
in dramatically different ways, even for the same pain stimulus. And there are multiple factors that contribute to these individual differences in pain. I showed you some examples of gender and age differences. We've also studied ethnic group differences, genetic differences, psychological factors. And of course, the goal here is to better understand all of the factors contributing to pain so that we can better diagnose and treat pain uh, as we move forward because this is a major public health issue. And so the other thing I wanted to mention is how did I get into this? How did I come to the point where I make a living hurting people, right? <laughs> this, is, this is not what I dreamed of when I was a kid. I mean, part of it is pure blind luck. I wound up in a psychology class in high school. I found it interesting, ended up majoring uh, in psychology uh, as an undergraduate, realizing quickly that I can't get a job with a psychology major, so I should go to graduate school. And I pursued clinical psychology and got interested in a, what was then a fairly new field of medical psychology or behavioral medicine and, and had the opportunity to work in a pain clinic, which is how I, I got into the pain research field. As I mentioned, I worked clinically for three years uh, treating people with chronic pain, trying to help them learn, learn how to manage their chronic pain more effectively, which on the one hand I found very rewarding, but on the other hand it is taxing. As you might imagine, people who are experiencing chronic pain aren't terribly happy, right? And talking to them about their difficulties all day, every day uh, can take a toll. And the other thing is I, uh, I really realized I missed the intellectual stimulation of the research environment, talking to colleagues about what they're doing, discovering new knowledge, and I didn't realize how important that was to me until I stopped doing it. And so at that point, I stopped making a regular person's salary and started making a postdoctoral fellow's salary for a couple of years in order to get back into uh, uh, into the academic setting, but uh, I'm certainly glad that I did. And, and so one thing I would say is uh, that there are many types of science and many types of scientists, right? We don't all squirt things in test tubes. I've never, no, that's not true. I have squirted things in test tubes, but I seldom do that. I've never worn a pocket protector. We don't all lack social skills like Sheldon, um, and we don't all love Star Trek, although I sort of do love Star Trek. Um, but, but, you know, you can have a variety of interests, and there are a variety of paths, and there are many types of science that would match most any interest. So in our lab, how are things structured, and how do students get involved? Well, we have a variety of people working in the lab. I do have full-time employees who help to run the studies. And I have postdocs and graduate students who are, A, involved in helping to run the studies, but B, involved in developing their own projects and moving their own careers forward. And we always have a, a nice cadre of undergraduate research assistants who come into the laboratory uh, and we train them to do essentially all aspects of the study. They test our patients with arthritis and with TMJ pain and the other studies, doing the quantitative sensory testing, the pain testing, helping to administer questionnaires, doing follow-up phone calls, really doing all aspects of the research. And frankly, we count on our undergraduate research assistants. They do a great job and, and contribute an awful lot uh, to our program. So there's really a lot of opportunity, uh, not just in my lab, but in many labs at UF to get engaged in research, which is really the best way to see how you like it. Uh, and so that's all I have for the presentation. I thank you for coming, and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have now.